Hello, Hunters, and welcome back to Super Fan Natural. Demons. We've all got them. Demons are the first race of paranormal creature that we see in Supernatural, and they're going to be its most reoccurrent. Over the course of 15 seasons, the Winchesters would encounter a lot of demons. It's kind of hilarious, actually, because when you go back to the early seasons, they talk about demons with fear and awe. In the show, demons come in a variety of flavors, as there are different classes or subspecies of infernal fiends that are each just a little different. So, since I already made a video describing and listing every type of angel, I figured why not do one for demons? As always, basic information first. Unlike some mythologies, the demons in Supernatural aren't fallen angels or primordial monsters. They're just people, or at least they were. Demons are made by twisting and corrupting the souls of humans until they've lost most of their humanity and are reduced to angry, violent spirits. The first demons were created by the Archangel Lucifer. When he realized he wasn't God's favorite anymore, he decided to punish his dad by taking one of his precious Homo sapiens and corrupting her in order to show just how flawed humanity was. And boom, Lilith, the first demon. Lucy made a handful of demons himself before God locked him away in the deepest, most inaccessible parts of hell. After that, demons were made by other demons who would torture the souls of people who ended up in hell, either because they were too naughty or because they sold their soul. Keep in mind that everyone that goes to heck gets tortured, but not everyone gets demonified. It's not specified whether the demon making process is a special kind of enhanced interrogation, or if some people are just more susceptible to becoming spooky, smoky ghosts. Well, they aren't really ghosts, or at least they're very special types of ghosts. Unlike other ghosts, Demons can't usually appear human on Earth, and they can't really interact with the material world. Instead, they appear as clouds of black smoke, and if they want to do anything other than fly around and mess with electronics, they've got to possess someone by flying into their mouth or eyes. Once they've got a body, they become pretty scary. Not only do demons have a bunch of powers, they're also not really affected by injuries caused by non-magical means, and they can keep going even after being stabbed, shot, immolated, decapitated, or defenestrated. The only mundane objects that can cause them real pain are holy water, salt, and iron. If a demon touches any of these, it'll burn the evil spirit inside rather than just the vessel. Outside of vessels, demons usually all look the same. There are outliers, for example, Crowley's smoke form was red for some reason, and also sometimes the effect just looks different, but that's usually due to technology and budget rather than lore. No, what really distinguishes demons physically is their eyes. While inside a meat suit, demons can transform their host's eyes in order to flex their presence, and what their eyes look like can vary depending on the demon's particular class or subspecies. We'll begin with the simplest form of demondom, the basic black-eyed boys. The simplest and arguably weakest type of demon manifests black eyes, and they're often equipped with only the most basic of infernal powers, namely super strength, telekinesis, and teleportation. Now, little caveat here, there are black-eyed demons with specialized powers and positions, and I'll be talking about them in the next few sections, but unless you hear a fancy title, most of the time when you see black eyes, you can assume you're looking at a basic bitch. However, just because these dudes aren't the strongest demons doesn't mean that they aren't a threat. They seem to be physically stronger than the average monster, and when enough of them get together, they can even overpower an alpha. It's worth mentioning that while most of the nameless minion demons have black eyes, it doesn't mean that all black eyes are nameless minions. Two of the most prominent demons in the show, Meg and Ruby, were black-eyed, and yet they both had close relationships with demons much higher in the food chain, and were trusted with incredibly important missions. As a whole, this may not be the most impressive class, but that doesn't mean that its members aren't important. The next group of demons I'm going to talk about also have black eyes. However, they also have unique powers as well as an official name for their club. The Seven Deadly Sins are a group of, well, seven, black-eyed demons that all have some form of mind control ability. They can't necessarily make their victims do anything. Instead, each sin can induce a certain type of behavior in people, and they can crank it up to self-destructive levels. For example, sloth can make people so lazy they starve to death rather than getting up to get food from the next room. Envy can make people want something so bad that they kill for it. Gluttony can make someone so desperate to consume they drink bleach. Lust can make you so horny you're willing to bone your enemy in the middle of a life or death fight. Heh <laughs> talk about hate bang, am I right? Up top. Uh, anyway, we don't really get a look at what greed, wrath, or pride can do, but I think you can probably guess. Beyond their sin powers, these demons don't seem to be any stronger or more durable than other black eyes. 
In fact, greed, gluttony, and pride are the first demons in the show to get ganked by Ruby's knife. What I want to know is, will their powers work on monsters? That could be a recipe for absolute chaos. Imagine gluttony on a leviathan. Ugh. Before I get to the last category of black-eyed demons, I first have to talk about one of the strongest and most unique demons in the series. He's also one of the few whose real name we actually know, and that name is Cain. Yes, this is the biblical Cain, Adam and Eve's first kid who would go on to kill his little brother. In the lore of Supernatural, what actually happened was that Abel was being manipulated and corrupted by Lucifer, and when Cain tried to put a stop to it, Lucifer agreed to leave him alone with two conditions. First, Cain had to become the new bearer of the Mark, a weird tattoo that acts as the seal to an extra-dimensional prison which contains God's sister, the Darkness. It's a little complicated. All you need to know is that Lucifer had the mark and he gave it to Cain. Secondly, if Cain wanted Abel to be pure enough for heaven, he would have to send him there himself. So Cain took the jawbone of an animal and turned it into a little blade, the first blade, and used it to cut down his bro. Then in a fit of grief, he turned the blade on himself and tried to opt out. However, that wasn't so easy. See, the mark, now called the mark of Cain, comes with some side effects and one of which is an almost complete inability to be perma-killed. Sometimes this manifests as just not being hurt by something. However, if a human mark bearer gets fatally poked, they'll stay down for a while, but will eventually be revived as a demon. That's what happened to Cain, and later his distant descendant, Dean Winchester, after Cain gave him a copy of the mark. This makes them the only two demons who weren't converted by Lucifer or Hell. It's never really explained why that happened, but if you want my theory, check out my video on the demon knife. Anyway, as a demon, Cain was incredibly powerful and dangerous as he wielded a few unique abilities. Whenever he held the first blade, it became one of the most powerful objects in the show, as it could take out pretty much anything. We don't know if it could kill or even hurt the likes of Death or the God Twins, but it seems like pretty much anything below them was susceptible to the blade's power, but again, it only worked like that when it was used by someone with the mark. Cain also had the ability to smite demons, kind of like angels, except his version of the death touch gave off a red glow instead of a blue or gold one. When Dean became a mark demon, he never used this ability, so it's unclear if he had it. One ability we saw from Demon Dean, but not Cain, was regeneration, as minor wounds would rapidly heal. Finally, Cain was the only demon in the entire show who was completely unaffected by the demon killing knife like he didn't even flicker after taking it to the heart. So, now that we've talked about Cain, I can talk about the demons that he personally trained, the Knights of Hell. The Knights served as an elite warrior unit for Hell's army, and they were among the first generations of Hellspawn. Cain claimed that they were hand-picked by Lucy himself, and that would mean that they were probably old enough to see the Garden of Eden. We don't actually know all that much about the Knights, or their order, since we only ever saw or heard of one, Abaddon. I assume we can gauge the other Knights based on what we see from Abby, after all, there's no dialogue to suggest that she was some kind of outlier, but for all we know, every knight was different. Anyway, Abaddon had black eyes, but she was by no means a chump. She was incredibly ruthless and vicious, and she could complement her brutality with several unique abilities. First, she was able to survive a fatal poke from the knife, and in fact, it was stated that the only way to drop her was the first blade. I don't know if that's true, since we only saw her tank the knife, we never saw her go up against the likes of an angel blade or the cult, so who knows, but regardless, she was quite durable. She could also read minds by sending a fragment of her demonic smoke into someone's head. This is interesting for a few reasons. Not only do we never see anyone else read minds like this, I don't believe we ever saw another demon move part of their smoke form independently from the rest. It makes me wonder if the knight's ability to survive fatal damage comes down to the fact that they could isolate and maybe amputate damaged essence. Abby could also exercise other demons in a way similar to Sam's Season 4 psychic powers, though Abaddon had to touch her target. So yeah, if Abaddon was a good representation of her order, then it's safe to say the Knights of Hell were pretty scary. Don't worry though, you don't have to be afraid of them. Mostly because they're fictional, but also because they're one of only two demonic orders that are definitely extinct by the end of the series. By the year 1863, Cain had terminated all of them but Abaddon. Then he retired, so she stuck around until the 50s. Then she got sucked through a time travel closet into 2013. Then a year later, Dean absolutely mashed her after getting the mark and the blade. Alright, now that we've thoroughly covered black eyed demons, let's move on to a class that not only has a different eye color, but also a different job. Instead of being minions or mercenaries, the red eyed crossroads demons are Hell's sales division. 
Their job is simple. They convince as many people as possible to sell their souls, thus ensuring they end up in the pit after they croak. If you haven't seen the show, you may be asking, what would compel someone to agree to that? Well, in return for agreeing to spend eternity in the torture dimension, you get what amounts to a wish, and you can use it to ask for some cool stuff. Money, fame, love, a bigger dick, artistic talent, even bringing someone back from the dead. All of that could be yours for the low, low price of one soul. Now, it's easy to hear that and think that these are the most powerful demons ever. I mean, they can bend reality. Thing is, Crossroads demons can make big things happen, but not at will. We don't know exactly how their wish powers work, but it kind of seems like they draw on the collective power of the souls already in hell, and they can only do it if they've secured another soul. Think of it like a bank. The red-eyed demons are loan officers. They can't just give money away, but they are authorized to lend a chunk so long as it gets paid back. There's a lot more to demon deals that I'll cover in its own video. Here I mostly want to focus on the demons that make the deals. Crossroads demons aren't the only Infernalis adversaria that can make deals. However, they act as specialists who focus entirely on getting those damn numbers up. We don't really know how they're made in relation to their black-eyed co-workers. Like, is there a special process, or is it just that some people end up with red eyes? No clue. We do know that one Crossroads demon is appointed to act as a kind of supervisor who all of their red eyes report to, and who reports directly to the ruler of hell. Unless, of course, they are the current ruler of hell, as we saw with the show's most prominent demon, Crowley, who needs his own video. So up to this point, all the demons we've covered have been what you might call working class. Like, regardless of their raw power, none of them were meant to have all that much authority over the whole of damnation. However, the next two groups are more akin to upper management, or even royalty. In fact, we're now going to cover the Princes of Hell. These yellow-eyed bastards are said to be the first generation of demons after Lilith, handmade by Lucifer himself. Why? Well, it's right there in the name. They're princes. They're meant to be near or even at the top of the demonic legions, topped only by Lucifer and maybe Lilith. More on that later. There's only four princes, Azazel, Ramiel, Dagon, and Asmodeus. And between their numbers and role, it really feels like they were meant to be Hell's version of the Archangels. Now, they're not nearly as strong as the Arcs, but still, they are extremely powerful and come equipped with tricks we don't really see from other demons. For example, Azazel could enter and manipulate people's dreams. He was seemingly immune to holy water, and one time he possessed a friggin' reaper. Ramiel tanked death blows from both a knife and an angel blade. Dagon could vaporize angels with her bare hands and put thoughts into other people's minds. Asmodeus was a little weird because he was powered up by Archangel Grace during his entire run on the show, and this gave him extra powers like shapeshifting. Besides that, we don't know for certain whether or not all the princes have the same baseline abilities. I think they do, but there's room to argue. We do know that they aren't equally strong, as Lucifer described Asmodeus as being the weakest without his grace enhancements. Additionally, after Azazel and Lilith and Lucifer were taken out of the commission, Ramiel was stated to be the next in line for the throne, further indicating that there's some kind of ranking amongst the princes. Since Ramiel was approached before Dagon, we can assume he ranks above her, however where exactly Azazel falls is hard to say. Like I said, the princes were meant to act as some kind of rulers in hell. It's likely that they were supposed to enforce Lucifer's will amongst the lower orders and rule in his absence. Azazel was totally on board, he ruled hell for god knows how long, working tirelessly to release Lucifer without ever faltering in his veneration for Satan. The other princes were loyal for a time, but eventually they lost faith and went off to do their own things. Still, Dagon retained some loyalty to her maker, and Asmodeus would hold the throne for a while, though that was for his own benefit. What's kind of interesting about the princes is that each one is responsible for some pretty major events in the series. Azazel is pretty much responsible for the entire series happening due to his deal with and murder of Mary Winchester. Ramiel is responsible for putting Crowley in charge of Hell, which is such a big event, I don't even know where to start. Dagon is kind of responsible for Jack be being born, as she kept Kelly from magic aborting him, which led to Cass seeing a vision of the future which fueled him to ensure the Nephilim was born. Finally, Asmodeus was responsible for finding the Archangel Blade, which is what finally killed Lucifer. As with most demons, we never learned what Lucy did to make the princes so special. However, the theory that I subscribe to is that while he was turning them, he imbued them with just a pinch of his grace. Not a lot, just a drop, similar to how Azazel was able to give humans psychic powers by feeding them a few drops of his blood. 
We know that Archangel Grace can be used like this, as the Apocalypse World Michael was able to supercharge monsters by feeding them a special grace-laced mixture. Also, like I said before, Asmodeus was able to power up by just injecting himself with Gabriel's grace. Maybe the reason he was able to just shoot up with a pure product is because he already has a dash of the stuff within him. This would be similar to how Lucifer's half-human son Jack was able to just absorb Michael's grace. He already had Archangel power woven into his being. Speaking of Jack, his eyes glow golden yellow in a way that's somewhat similar to the Prince's. I mean, it is different. His eyes glow bright and retain their pupils, while the Prince's have a more sickly yellow with the wavy pattern. But I mean, they're similar enough for some people to speculate that the Prince's are just straight up Nephilim. I wouldn't go that far, but I do think that in an attempt to make his own version of the Archangels, Lucifer granted his elites just a smidge of cosmic power. Despite all their power, the princes were the second order of demons to go extinct. Azazel gets capped with the cult at the end of season 2. In season 12, Ramu gets jabbed with the Lance of Michael, and Dagon gets fried by a supercharged Cass. Then in season 13, Asmodeus gets lit up by Gabriel, finally putting an end to the yellow-eyed demons. So the princes are pretty important, but there is one class of demon that may outrank them. That would be the enigmatic white-eyed demons. When it comes to this class of devil, we know exceedingly little. Unlike their red and yellow colleagues, there doesn't seem to have been a formal name for this class, and part of that could be due to the fact that there's only two that we know of. Who are these mysterious milky-eyed monstrosities? Well, I've already mentioned the first one. It's me, Lilith. Yes, the very first demon to ever exist came with white eyes. As you might expect, Lilith's position as the first of the fallen came with some special perks. She's widely accepted to be the strongest demon ever, at least in terms of innate power. That's technically never confirmed, but whether or not she sits at the very top, she is quite powerful. We don't see many unique tricks from her, however, she was able to shoot out this blast of burning light that I call the Demon Death Ray. This blast was strong enough to blow up a police station, though we unfortunately don't get to see what it does to people since the only on-screen hits we ever see are Sam, who was immune. Besides her power, Lilith had another unique trait. She knew how to break the seals on Lucifer's cage and after 65 were broken, her death would break the last one, letting Lucy out. So yeah, she's kind of a big deal. Now, you might be tempted to think that white eyes indicate the oldest and most powerful demons. That may fit Lilith, but when it comes to her only known ocular kin, it gets a little muddy. In Season 4, we met Alistair, Hell's Grand Torturer, who, like Lilith, packed some pearly peepers. Also like her, he was weirdly powerful, as he was the first of only four demons to tank a jab from the knife. He could also go toe-to-toe -to -toe with low-level angels back when that was a really big deal. That was because he was somehow immune to their smiting power, and he knew spells to send them away. Like I said, he was the Grand Torturer of Hell, meaning that he was the guy in charge of inflicting pain. In Hell. So yeah, it's not really his power or prestige that seem at odds with Lilith. It's his age and origin. We don't really know anything about them. Prior to Season 12, it was safe to guess that Ali was one of the first demons, However, after it was explicitly stated that the yellow-eyed princes were the first generation after Lilith, it just became a little less clear where the other white-eyed demon came from. There's plenty of theories, but the one that I like best is that white eyes denote demons that have truly lost every last bit of their humanity. As a whole, demons are real meanies. However, we do see examples of black and red eyes having moments of mercy, empathy, even kindness. I mean, it's rare, but it does happen. Hell, even the princes seem to have a bit of a soft side, as Azazel viewed two demons as his children, and was genuinely pissed after one got got. By contrast, we don't see anything like that from the whites. They both seem completely heartless. I mean, it helps that we just don't see that much of them, but come on, can you really imagine either of them showing mercy? Yeah, good luck, I'm sure the guy in charge of torturing the souls of the damned can be persuaded to show compassion. No, I feel like once someone becomes a white-eyed demon, they've lost virtually all good within them, leaving only humanity's worst qualities. After all, that's what Lucifer wanted to show God when he made Lilith. He wanted his dad to see the most vile parts of his new favorite creation. That's all the major classes of demon. However, we're not done yet. Throughout the series, we see several unique forms of Hellspawn that show up once and then are never seen or heard from again. The first and coolest of them is the seemingly one-of-a-kind Sam Hain. Some of you probably recognize that this guy is named after the incorrect way of saying the original name for Halloween. 
and that's because he's literally the demon of Halloween, and within the show's lore, the holiday was created because of him. Hearing that may tempt you to picture some kind of whimsical trickster a la Jack Skellington, however you'd be a little off. Instead of lighthearted pranks, this guy's idea of spooky fun involves raising the dead in the form of angry ghosts and feral zombies. Now, the thing is, he can only do this on October 31st, either because that's when his powers work, or maybe because that's the only day he can actually come to Earth. The wording in his one episode made it a little unclear. Whatever the case, his antics led the ancient Celts to adopt some wacky habits on that night, things like dressing up in costumes to hide from him, carving jack-o'-lanterns as icons of veneration, giving out offerings to appease him. Basically, most of Halloween's core traditions were originally meant to avoid this dude, at least within the show's mythology. So yeah, Sammy Boy was a pretty unique demon. The only other Hellion we see summon the undead was Lilith, though she needed to use a spell, whereas Hain could just do it with a glance. Also like Lilith, he could use the demonic death ray, although we know that they aren't the same species of demon, since instead of having pure white eyes, his are pale blue with small black pupils. This, in my opinion, is a travesty. You have a Halloween demon and you don't give him orange eyes? Huge mistake. They should have been orange with triangular black pupils to make him look like a jack-o'-lantern. Speaking of his eyes, they don't seem to work too well, as his vision is real blurry for some reason. This is why wearing costumes to hide from him became a common tradition, because it seems like it actually works, to a certain extent, as long as you play the part. I don't really have any ideas as to why there's this one random holiday demon, but I wonder if maybe in life he wasn't a regular human, but rather a demigod. Like maybe he was the half-human son of a pagan deity, like the Kaliak or something, I don't know. Like I said before, it seems like Hain can only operate on Halloween. We know that 600 years before the show, he was exorcised and sent to the deep pits of hell. There is a spell that can summon him back to Earth, but it can only be performed once every 600 years or so. Doing this can actually be used to break one of the seals on Lucifer's cage, but only if it's done after the first one is broken. The last thing I'll say about Sam Hain is that the word he was named after is pronounced Samhain. I know it's spelled like this, but I mean, Gaelic and English have a weird relationship. The next weird demon is one that I call the Plane Crash Demon. As you may have guessed by the name, this dude dedicates his free time to crashing airplanes, which in and of itself is a little strange, However, it also has a few weird, unique features. Its smoke form looks more like a black particle swarm, and it would enter through the eyes rather than the mouth. It also had an odd weakness. If it heard the word Christos, it would be compelled to show its black eyes. So pretty peculiar, but there is a reason for all the oddities. This was the second demon to appear in the series, and the first to actually be identified as a demon, since when Azazel showed up in the pilot, he's just a mysterious figure over Sam's crib. As such, this is a classic case of what I call early series weirdness, where the writers were still experimenting with some concepts that later became standardized. By this point, you probably have a pretty good grasp on how demons operate, right? Well, let's throw a few curveballs. Throughout the series, the writers would occasionally introduce breeds of demon that operated completely different from what I've described so far. The first of these were the Devas. Devas were introduced as Zoroastrian shadow demons, though whether or not they're actually demons is debatable. Unlike other demons, these things don't appear as smoke, instead they're humanoids who are invisible except for their shadows. They also don't possess people, instead they can physically interact with the world. They seem more animalistic than other demons, and when you combine that with their invisibility, they seem more similar to hellhounds than demons. We don't know where these things usually hang out, as the only ones we ever saw were being controlled by Meg using a special ritual. Next in Season 2, we were introduced to the Achiri demon. Unlike Deva's, these are actual demons, as they have a smoke form. However, they don't possess people. Instead, they can manifest a physical form, which usually looks like a little girl, at least until you get too close. Once they're in striking distance, they can become way more monstrous by growing claws and turning one eye black and the other white. We literally have no idea as to why these things are so strange. In fact, we don't know if there's more than one. Sam seems to suggest that this is a species of demon, but since we only ever see the one, who knows? Like Devas, they seem a bit more savage and primal than regular demons, and they can be summoned and controlled using psychic powers. The final strange subspecies of satanic spirit isn't found in the main universe. In the apocalypse world, there is a type of demon called a tempter demon. The only thing we know about these things is that they look real different. Like other demons, they have black eyes, 
However, unlike any demons from the main universe, they also have horns and fangs. Basically, they're the most demonic looking demons in the show, and we have absolutely no idea why. We don't even know if they possess people, or if this is their true form manifested on Earth. Lots of questions, and basically no answers. This next entry is kind of weird, because I don't know if they're technically demons. In fact, these things are one of the show's biggest mysteries. In the most inaccessible depths of the pit, there is a race of creatures known as the Shadim. These guys are described as being Hell's most savage, as well as being so dark and base that God himself wouldn't allow them into the light. If that's not weird enough for you, then chew on this. Lucifer feared them. Lucifer. The devil. God's second most powerful creation, and the guy who thought he could 1v1 the darkness. He was afraid of the Shadim. What in God's name are these things, and more importantly, where did they come from? Also, keep in mind that when God got pissed and opened all the doors to hell, including the one to the cage, he seemed to have left the Shadim's prison intact, so like, is he also scared of them? The only glimpse we get of these things is a creepy clawed hand when Jack momentarily opens a gate into their domain or whatever. These things definitely deserve their own video, I just wanted to mention them here since they are part of hell I guess. I'll wrap up this video with a creature that is demonic, but not completely. Like angels, demons are capable of reproducing with humans, which produces a hybrid more powerful than either of its parents. We only know of one such hybrid, known as a Cambion, and he was a boy named Jesse Turner. This kid may not look like much, but if you believe Castiel, then he is the closest thing to the biblical Antichrist. He isn't the son of Lucifer, that came later. No, Jesse's dad is a nameless black-eyed demon who was somehow able to impregnate a woman while possessing her. This is really weird since when Lucifer actually went to make a kid, he had to possess a dude and do it the human way, meaning that his actual son technically has three parents, whereas Jesse just has the two. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that demons used to be human, I don't know, but however it works, it produced a kid with a crazy amount of potential. Without even knowing he had powers, Jesse was able to warp reality around him in order to make his understanding of the world real. He unintentionally made urban legends real and caused practical jokes to become dangerous. He even turned Cass into a cute little action figure. Again, I need to stress that he didn't even know he had powers, this stuff just happened. Once he learned about his abilities, it seemed like he could do pretty much anything he wanted. Now, his powers were only this strong because Lucifer was on Earth at the time, but Cass also said his strength would grow, so we really don't know his baseline or ceiling. However, what's more important than his abilities is his character. Despite being the literal half-demon Antichrist, Jesse was just a normal kid. Like the show's other Antichrist, Jesse wasn't inherently evil. He was just a person who could be good or bad depending on his influences and choices. In the end, he decides against being a part of the apocalypse and warps away to parts unknown. It's implied he went to Australia, but we don't know for sure. But boy, do people wonder. I'm pretty sure that what happened to the Antichrist kid is the most asked question on the Supernatural subreddit. And with that, we've covered pretty much every type of demon in the show. There was a mention of green-eyed demons, but I mean, that's literally all the info we ever got on that. I hope you enjoyed this video. While I was making it, I finally hit a thousand subs, so as promised, a video theorizing about how the cult works is on the way. It'll probably come out in November, because I have a different type of video planned for October. Thank you so, so much to everyone who likes, subscribes, or even just watches these videos. I'll have more for you next month, but for now, carry on.